Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Monday Morning Tennis Rant. And I want to start with something that's been on my mind for a while and I want to talk about it. So as you guys know, Rafa is my favorite player of all time. And I really want him to go out and finish his career on his own terms. Hopefully he's going to be able to play the French Open, but his body is letting him down. He's not able to compete at that level so he went to the united states played the netflix slam had the best intentions to play indian wells and had to pull out he didn't specify why but i heard it was because of a back injury and that's all fine and well it's unfortunate for the fans but here is where i have a problem with whoever is running rafa's social media more specifically his instagram account because i know that rafa is not doing that personally so a day after pulling out of Indian Wells on Rafa's Instagram story, you could see Rafa practicing on clay. He then goes off to Europe and continues to practice. He's got all the intentions to play Monte Carlo, pulls out. And again, the next day on his Instagram story, Rafa is seen on the practice court. And fans are interpreting this in the wrong way, obviously. They're thinking he's just pulling out of these tournaments willy-nilly and continues to practice. Now, what I think is happening there must be something going on either with his back or his abdominals he actually said that there's an abdominal problem and he's probably able to practice and hit ground strokes but he most likely has a hard time hitting serves and I get that he's practicing right after pulling out of these tournaments but the way this looks to the general tennis audience that maybe is not so familiar with how tennis works at that level they're seeing this as something very negative and deservedly so, Rafa is getting a lot of heat on social media. So whoever is running Rafa's social media needs to get his or her act together because quite frankly, they're making Rafa look bad. And if Rafa himself is responsible for this, he's got to stop posting practices right after pulling out of tournaments because it doesn't make any sense and fans are getting frustrated. Last week, Jose Higueras, who was the head of USDA player development, wrote an email to the higher-ups in the tennis community. And this email was talking about the fact that the USDA slashed the budget. And if you want to hear a great take on this situation, you got to listen to the Served podcast with Andy Roddick. I agree 100% with everything that Andy said. I will say one thing, though. Roddick talked about the fact that it's hard to take credit for a player's success because many people are involved. And Andy was saying that in that email, it appeared that Higueras was taking credit for all the success the players had. And while I do agree that it appeared that he was taking credit for the player's successes in the email, I did listen to Jose Higueras on the Craig Shapiro podcast, and he said several times that he was not taking credit, that the credit belongs to many coaches and Shapiro even repeated that by saying there's many cooks stirring the pot so I think maybe Higueras knew that the wording in that email was a little bit strong and of course this is what a lot of tennis academies do they take credit for players of course tennis federations do this as well it's very common in the tennis scene but of course it's hard to pinpoint who is most responsible for players successes generally most of the credit should go to the developmental coaches the ones that are responsible for building the players when they're very young before they reach the top of the junior rankings before they get swooped up by the federations and the academies those are the unsung heroes of tennis coaching and they never get any credit in fact nobody knows uh, these coaches names most of the time now i have a couple of friends of mine who are in this situation they have built players who became Grand Slam champions, top 10 players in the world. And I am planning to feature uh, these two guys on my channel in the future. Now, speaking of USDA player development and American tennis in general, I have a series of videos on my channel that's titled, What Happened to American Tennis? And if you look at the thumbnail of these videos, there's a pickleball court on the thumbnail for a reason, because if we go back five years ago, I was very worried about the state of tennis. I saw that pickleball was blowing up where you had people packing the pickleball courts while the tennis courts were pretty empty. This is still the case today, but the situation has changed completely and tennis is in a really good space. Let me explain it this way. Five years ago, 
I knew that the big three didn't have a lot of time left. And I thought that we were gonna go into a dark phase of the ATP, something similar to what was happening in the early 2000s when Sampras retired. And I actually thought it was gonna be a lot worse. So the combination of the big three who are the most popular players in the history of tennis, especially Nadal and Federer, they were gonna be gone and pickleball is blowing up. And I was actually very worried for tennis, but I can tell you that tennis is in such a good place. I cannot believe that we have Alcaraz, Sinner, and some of the other young players who are coming up. Attendance records are being broken at tournaments. Tennis is being talked about. Tennis is being watched on TV. Tennis is in a fantastic place. And pickleball is not a threat at all. And it's for that reason that I haven't done a video titled What Happened to American Tennis in a long time because there's absolutely nothing wrong with American tennis. In fact, yesterday I checked again something that I always do in those what happened to American tennis videos and I checked the statistics. Which country has the most players in the top 100? And I can tell you that the United States has the most players both on the ATP and the WTA in the top 100 in the world. So American tennis is doing really well. There are a lot of young players coming up. American women's tennis has always done well and it continues to do so. Now, a lot of people are still gonna say that American tennis is terrible for one reason, and that is that there hasn't been an American US Open champion since Andy Roddick in 2003. It takes a special type of player to win a Grand Slam tournament, especially the US Open as an American. There are so many intangibles that are required from a player to be able to pull off such a feat. It's going to be so hard to go through players like Djokovic, Sinner, and Alcaraz to take a Grand Slam title. And speaking of USDA player development, these intangibles are not going to be things that you can coach, teach, purchase. These are things that have to come with the player. They have to come from within. A player has to be born with these intangible qualities to reach that super high elite level, what I call the GOAT level. So while American tennis is doing great, I don't think there's going to be an American US Open champion for a while. However, last year I made a video about Ben Shelton and I said that he might be the next American superstar player, and I stand by that. Shelton just won a tournament on red clay in Houston by beating TFO in the final. He's now up to number 14 in the world, only one spot behind Taylor Fritz, who's at 13, the number one American, so it's only a matter of time until Ben Shelton becomes the number one ranked American player. And there is something special about Shelton. Last year, I made a video talking about his serve. He's got one of the best serves in the world, but there's more to him. His presence on the court is different from other players. He also has a little bit more variety than some of the American players who tend to depend more on a big serve and a strong baseline game. Shelton is starting to come in more and more, but most importantly, what I'm seeing from Shelton this year is maturity. Remember last year at the US Open when he did the phone thing, there was so much drama about this phone thing. He was getting a lot of hate, and thankfully he has stopped doing the phone thing, and you can see his maturity on the court. Yes, he still lets his personality shine through, but he's maturing and he's playing better and better. So while I do think think that it's going to be tough for an American to win a Grand Slam, more specifically the US Open. I do think that Ben Shelton has a chance, not quite yet, but down the road, I think he can take that title. Now, there were a couple of other 250s on the ATP on clay, and in Morocco, Berrettini won a tournament. And it was so nice to see because Berrettini was injured for a while. He played a challenger in Arizona where he reached the final. I think that was very important for him to get the confidence back and get some matches under his belt. And now he gets on the clay and wins a title. It's going to be fun to see how high Berrettini can go, whether he can go back in the top 10. He's a very strong player. He's got a big serve, a big forehand. Can you imagine Sinner, Berrettini in the top 10 and then all the other young Italians right behind them? Italy is right now turning into the next tennis superpower. I don't know if you guys know this, but outside of Rafa, 
some of my favorite players are the ones that have big serves, whether it's the WTA or the ATP. That's why I love watching John Isner play. And right now, there are more and more big servers on the ATP Tour. And the best one out of all of them is Hubert Korkac. Last year, he served over a thousand aces. I made a video a while back talking about the Martin Dumm serve, which is amazing. I claim that Dumm has a chance to get and the ATP 1000 club, which means that you serve more than 1000 aces in the season and Hurkac did that. And this is such a hard feat to accomplish. Only seven players in history have been able to do so. And this year Hurkac is continuing to serve well. He's number one on the ATP in aces per match and total aces. And I am gonna do a full length video analyzing who be served and of course, discuss what we all can learn from such a great serve. Hurkac is the first Polish player to win a clay court title since Wojciech Fibak did it in 1981. Now unfortunately Hubi's success on clay was overshadowed by possibly the worst umpire decision in the history of ATP tennis closely followed by some of the worst sportsmanship that I've ever seen. And for you guys that don't know what I'm talking about, look this up on Tennis TV on YouTube. They have the whole clip right there. But I'm going to tell you what happened. So, Borges, who is from Portugal, was playing on home soil against Garin. And Garin won the first set 6-2. Borges was up 3-2 in the second set, break point. It was 30-40, Garin serving. Garin makes the serve. Borges makes the return. Now, Garin hits a forehand long. It looked out to me. The Lions judges didn't call it, the umpire didn't call it, but somebody in the crowd shouted out. So Borges put the ball back in play and just kind of stood there because he was a little bit confused and Garin hit a forehand cross court about this wide. Now, after Garin missed pretty much two forehands in a row, he still somehow got the point. The umpire was so confused and thought that Garin made that second forehand even though it was about this far out. Now this kind of brings back the talk about hindrance and stopping play, just like Djokovic against Nardi. The only time play should be stopped is if the player raises their hand, mimicking that the ball was out, or if they're audibly say out. Then the points should be stopped. The umpire is gonna go check the mark. If indeed the ball was out, the player that claimed that the ball was out gets the point. If indeed the ball was in, the other player gets the point. If the player stops playing, this does not mean the point is stopped. And this is also not hindrance. And this is where bad sportsmanship from Garin comes into play. He should have conceded this point to Borges or at least allowed Borges to replay this point. Maybe he didn't have control over it. That's true. So what I think Garin should have done on deuce is serve a double fault on purpose. That would be the sportsmanship-like thing to do. He didn't do that. He ended up winning the match. He was screaming in front of the crowd. The Portuguese crowd was going crazy against him. They were booing him. Afterwards, in the interview, he pretended like he didn't know what was going on. He had a coughing attack and he said that he needed to check the tape. And it's mind boggling to me because players have to be aware that these clips go viral, okay? The entire world saw the poor sportsmanship. So now, more than ever, it is to a player's advantage to act on the court with good sportsmanship because now what's happening with Garin, who I like, by the way, I like players from Chile. Rios was one of my favorite players and Chile's president has Croatian background. So I like Garin, but what he did now was ruin his reputation because anywhere you look on social media where there's a Garin clip, you're gonna see tons of comments calling him a cheater and much worse and deservingly so by the way because what he did there was poor sportsmanship and now on to the wta and i watched a lot of matches in charleston i want to say that this is possibly the best wta tournament of the year the stands are packed the draw is always stacked it is a 500 and not a thousand so not everybody's there but it is a very strong field every year and if you watch my monday morning rant from last week i talk about how daniel collins blazed through the draw in miami and also mentioned that she has a really tough draw in charleston but boy did she blaze 
through that draw in Charleston. The way she's playing right now reminds me of Serena. This is what I talked about last week. It's her confidence and her composure on the court. She's so aggressive, able to dictate play. My favorite Daniel Collins shot is her backhand cross court. Generally, when players pull the opponent off the court with a two-handed backhand cross court, it's more with top spin. But Daniel Collins is able to hit her two-handed backhand flat and get the really sharp cross court angles that then give her opportunities to put the ball away. Anytime she gets a floater, she pounces on her forehand and puts it away for a winner. And I never really thought of Danielle Collins' serve as a big weapon, but her serve is so strong. She gets so many free points and usually holds serve quite comfortably. Now, I said she reminds me of Serena. And in fact, Serena is the only other player who was able to win Miami and Charleston back to back, which is not easy to do because Miami is played on hard court and Charleston is played on hard true. And what I'm excited about are two tournaments for Collins, the Olympics and the US Open. I think this is where Collins can shine and I have a feeling that she's gonna go deep in both of those tournaments.